Okay, so I think we'll get started, Faroz. So welcome everyone. This is actually the 40th, 40th Climate Governance Webinar we are running since we launched in May last year. And we have quite a few more scheduled in the next few weeks and months. Today, I'm pleased to announce we are also partnering with Global Compact Malaysia for this event. And we are delighted that the Executive Director, Faroz Nader, can be with us this afternoon. Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, we are delighted to be here today. And we're pleased to have you here. So my name is Sunita and I'm a co-founder and chair of Climate Governance Malaysia, which was founded only last year. Our mission is to advocate to directors and boards, especially non-executive directors, about the top financial risk, which is the climate crisis. The climate crisis is the defining crisis of our generation. It is deeply complicated, but this is the decisive decade for humanity and all of society needs to act to mitigate and adapt to this risk. As for businesses, climate risk is a financial risk. It's not just a humanitarian disaster or a question of equity. It will result in liquidations and bankruptcies. It will impact retirement, your mortgage insurance capability. It's impacting your real life now. And many businesses are going to be asked by their investors and their bankers about their climate strategy. And it's becoming very clear that businesses which are not prepared will go bankrupt and directors could be personally liable because it is their fiduciary duty to be managing such key risks. Faroz Nader is already very familiar with um, SDG Goal 13, 14 and 15, which also impacts on almost all of the other goals. And I would like to invite Faroz to now say a few words about Global Compact Malaysia. Uh, many thanks, uh, Tatin Sri Sunita. So uh, Global Compact Network Malaysia is the local network of the United Nations Global Compact, uh, which is the world's largest corporate sustainability initiative with over uh, 10,000 members, uh, corporate members globally. So easy way, just think of us of a Chamber of Commerce of the UN. Uh, so we work with corporates on SDGs uh, via various approaches uh, such as global action platforms, toolkits, blueprints and research uh, papers. So recently here in Malaysia, we have uh, actively engaged our member Sarawak Energy Berhad to become the first Malaysian uh, GLC to commit to the science-based targets as part of their climate agenda. Thus, for us, climate governance is a priority uh, agenda and we are very pleased to be able to support uh, uh, CGM, which has done a terrific job in championing this course. Many thanks, Feroz. So the topic for today's webinar is renewable energy and I believe GCMY is a strong supporter of this too. Oh, yes, we are. So last, uh, at the last uh, UN General Assembly, uh, UNGC launched something called the SDG Ambition, which spells out the 10 key deliverables corporates must achieve uh, if we are to realize the SDGs within the next nine years. So key to this ambition is for businesses to achieve carbon net zero. Uh, renewable energy will be the key to enabling corporates to align towards the 1.5 degree pathway. And as a bonus, uh, renewable energy is also one of the easier uh, plug-ins for sustainability that corporates can embark on. We couldn't agree more. In Malaysia, our local grid is 93% fossil fuel in terms of generation capacity. And we absolutely need to pivot to more renewable sources of energy if we want to be aligned with Paris. There are gigawatts of RE coming on stream. So there are huge opportunities for those companies who are prepared and ready to make the pivot from brown to green. Many Malaysians rightly have expectations that businesses will do what's right in terms of protecting their future environments. So I'll leave it with our moderator uh, to introduce our speakers for today, but suffice to say that the conversation today is going to turn the spotlight on some very influential thought leaders in the space of renewable energy, energy planning, and power generation. I am definitely looking forward to this too. Uh, this is a great lineup, and I'm looking forward to hearing what Sam Kimmins from uh, RE100 has to say, uh, Dr. Winnie Chen, who has just retired from our, our energy agency, and of course, uh, from Davis Chong, one of our most successful solar panel vendors working closely on the ground. Yeah, thank you, Faroz. So I'm going to hand the session over to Ms. Marina Yong, who has um, worked in sustainability issues for nearly 30 years in a consulting work, covering environmental assessments, uh, developing environmental audit policies and energy policies for internationally funded projects. Uh, and all of this is building on her basic degree in marine biology, a master's degree in biological oceanography, and a postgraduate training in environmental science and technology. She is currently a non-executive director on two boards, a water utility company 
and a company advising on sustainable resource management for agriculture commodities. So we're placing ourselves in very good hands. Over to you, Marina. Thank you, Sunita, for that introduction. Welcome everyone to this exciting webinar. We hope that by the end of this webinar, you will feel so compelled to go out and start adopting renewable energy right away. Um, but first of all, I'd like to um, introduce the three speakers who are with us today in this webinar. They have so much to share with you today. Um, let me introduce, first of all, the first speaker. His name is Sam Kimmins. He is the head of RE100, which is part of the climate group. Um, today, he will explain to you what the RE100 does. Um, over his 25-year career, Sam has led sustainability projects across the shipping, aviation, and construction sectors. Prior to leading RE100, Sam spearheaded the Forum for the Future's Sustainable Shipping Initiative. He's currently non-executive director of the Ethical Consumer Research Association, and he holds a master's degree in pollution and environmental control from the University of Manchester. The second speaker we have today is Dr. Wayne Chen. I'm sure some of you are quite familiar with her because she has been a mainstay in the renewable energy industry here in Malaysia for quite some time. She holds a bachelor's degree in computer science from the University of Canterbury, an MBA from the University of Abdul Razak, and a doctor of business administration from the UKM. She was formerly the Chief Strategic Officer of the Sustainable Energy Development Authority from 2011 until 2020 this year. Um, from December 2005 till 2011, she served in the capacity of Technical Advisor to the Malaysian Building Integrated Photovoltaic Project, which was funded by the United Nations Development Programme. Prior to her work in Malaysia, she worked in New Zealand for 10 years in various industries. Um, today, she has carried her deep passion for renewable energy and energy transition to a new position with Hibiscus Petroleum Berhard as the Vice President of New Energy Ventures there. She is pursuing the energy transition uh, with an independent oil and gas exploration and production company, and, and that will be something that she will share with us today. A third and final speaker is Davis Chong. He's the group CEO of SolarVest Holdings Berhad. They've been in the news quite a bit lately with some very interesting market moves. Um, he will share with you some of the things that SolarVest um, has been doing as well as insights into the solar industry. Um, Davis has extensive marketing and corporate experience um, and has been always involved in the engineering, procurement, construction, and commissioning of solar um, projects in Malaysia, including grid tide and off-grid systems, as well as self-consumption models in the business segment from rooftop to utility scale solar. He believes in the vision of creating a world generated by renewable energy. And they have now, SolarVest has now installed more than 300 megawatts of solar plants across Malaysia and is now eyeing geographical expansion to the Southeast Asian countries, as well as establishing a footprint in the APAC Asia Pacific market. So um, with that, I would like to, in, to invite Dr. Well, I'm sorry, I'd like to invite Sam Kimmins to pre present his first, um, to be the first presenter. Sam, take it away. Thank you very much, Marina, and uh, thank you to, to Sunita and Climate, Climate Governance in Malaysia for inviting me today. It's a great pleasure to be uh, speaking. I wish I was in Malaysia, but unfortunately, I'm in a cold November morning in, in London. Um, so I'm going to quickly share my screen and um, tell you a little bit about um, RE100 for the next 15 minutes. Is that showing my presentation. Rena, just to check, is that is that showing me showing the presentation? Yes, it is. Thank you. That's great. Hang on a second. Oh, we lost it again. There we are. That's showing the, the, the right bit of the right screen. So um, 
I will tell you a little bit, a little bit about RE100. Uh, RE100 brings together the most world's most influential companies committed to sourcing 100% of their global electricity demand from renewable sources. Now, when we established RE100 in uh, 2014, uh, we were told we were crazy and that we wouldn't grow beyond our founding members, IKEA and Swiss Re. And uh, yeah, the challenge is for the companies is to commit to 100% renewable by at the latest date, uh, 2050, uh, across their entire global operations for their electricity use only. RE100 now has 267 members with um, Australia's Woolworths joining us this morning and adding another three terawatt hour, uh, two and a half terawatt hours per year of electricity demand to RE100. And you'll see there are companies from right across the, um, the world and across the, diff the spectrum of sectors, um, from electronics through to, um, to food, from clothing, um, across to real estate. So a, a really wide range of, of different types of company committed to 100% renewable electricity. The average date by which they have set their target is 2028. And a number of companies are announcing this year and next year that they have achieved their 100% target. So not only is this something that companies are prepared to sign up to, they are actually achieving. An interesting trend for the past uh, two years has been the growth of RE100 in Asia, uh, Asia Pacific, and um, uh, Japan is now actually the largest, um, has, has the second largest uh, number of RE100 members at 42, followed by the UK. So there's a bit of competition there between J Japan and, and the UK, but the US in the lead. But 40% of our growth has been in the Asia Pacific region over the last two years, really reflecting a growth of interest in climate issues in the region. So what does this mean in terms of what is the size of RE100? Well, um, the membership together represents 275 terawatt hours of electricity per year. Uh, that should, that's actually gone up to 277. That's more than double the size of Malaysia's uh, electricity demand, uh, annual uh, electricity demand. So together, a really, really powerful group of companies sending an incredibly strong signal to policymakers and investors and renewable energy suppliers that renewables are the future. That's around 1.4% of global electricity demand. What does this mean in real terms? Well, Bloomberg New Energy Finance calculated back in February when RE100 was a lot smaller that the combined membership, in order to achieve their targets, represented a $98 billion investment opportunity. Now this is very, uh, a very attractive proposition, both for um, renewable developers and also for, uh, for policymakers. And I shall tell you about that in a second. Why are companies doing this? Well, there are a couple of reasons. First of all, the price of renewables in a fair market is going down rapidly. Uh, we, we've seen a 70% fall in the cost of um, solar, um, since 2010 and a 45% uh, drop in the cost of wind since 2010. It's clearly looking very economically positive for companies to buy renewable electricity. So the, the simple economics are starting to stack up. But it's more than that. Companies want to show leadership. They also are asking their supply chains to use renewable electricity. So 70 Apple suppliers have agreed to use 100% renewable for Apple products. BT, IKEA, Walmart and H&M and many more uh, companies are following a similar path, asking their suppliers, suppliers to um, use renewables. Uh, one of our Japanese companies, ASCO, des described RE100 as their passport to international trade because it basically gave them their license to operate with leading companies, to supply leading companies. And things will only get tougher for those not using renewables when the EU um, launches its carbon tax, which is due sometime in 2022. And this is really to set a level playing field so that companies importing to the EU 
will be taxed on the carbon footprint of their products to ensure that uh, that companies within Europe who are making great strides are not put at a competitive disadvantage by um, by other products. But in a way, this has been argued. It has been argued that uh, with regard to electricity. This is a moot point because companies who are producing um, goods using renewable electricity will be getting a cost advantage anyway, which can be passed on to consumers. So I talked about the $98 billion investment opportunity presented by renewables. This is the volume of power purchase agreements. In simple terms, the power purchase agreement is a direct purchase if I'm a company, I will say I will say I would like to buy all the electricity from that solar farm or that wind farm, and um, so it's a direct deal between the supplier and the um, and the user. That's an incredibly simplified uh, version of what a PPA is, but effectively what it allows companies to do is take control of their electricity use and take advantage of the saved prices. You will see from the blue bar. Oh, two things to note on this this graph is that the, the curve is looking exponential. The amount that these companies are investing in renewables is growing exponentially. But you also notice that most of the, the buying has been in the USA and Europe, in the blue and green, uh, with Asia Pacific lagging behind somewhat. And this is, our members tell us, this is all due to policy. If a country does not have a favorable policy to allow investment at scale in renewables, they will be missing out on this corporate investment. And, com uh, and countries are listening to this. Um, I'll start from the bottom on this slide. Um, back in uh, 2018, we worked with the European Commission to ensure that all the, in the Renewable Energy Directive, Red 2, um, all, company, all countries in Europe were required to remove barriers to power purchase agreements, uh, to corporate power purchase agreements for renewable energy, um, and also requiring the implementation of an effective scheme of guarantees of origin across Europe. A lot of action in Asia recently, the Korean Green New Deal uh, promised PPAs to enable companies to join RE100 and um, the Japanese COVID stimulus package uh, launched a few months ago uh, provided $50 million US dollars equivalent um, support for on-site corporate PPAs. We're looking forward to more renewable support in the next um, in the next few weeks, following on from Japan's announcement of a zero carbon goal by 2050. Um, and we, we are very grateful to have the support of three Japanese government ministries who are, co who are committed as RE100 ambassadors, the Ministry of the Environment, Foreign Affairs and Defence. Reflecting on the importance of, of renewable, ele renewable electricity in the supply chain, President Tsai of Taiwan in November 2019 in her industrial policy keynote um, specifically mentioned RE100, say, stating that the ability for Taiwanese companies to achieve RE100 is a critical consideration for our industrial policy. At the time, the biggest power purchase agreement in Taiwan was a, uh, a 10 megawatt deal, um, a relatively small solar deal by, um, by Google. Fast forward to one year later and TSMC, the semiconductor manufacturer, had joined RE100 and had signed a 910 megawatt uh, offshore wind farm power purchase deal, which was at the time the biggest power purchase agreement in the world. So um, Taiwan has gone from um, a, 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 yeah, a, a late entrance to the, to, the, um, to the renewable energy world to a real leader in a very short time through ambitious policy and um, attractive, um, attractive policy to enable companies to invest. One thing I, I want to come back to this slide to you know, noticing two things. These are actually two Malaysian um, solar, um, uh, solar installations. On the right is the current state of the art for corporate um, installations, which is the, uh, a Tesco rooftop 
array, Tesco will be putting uh, solar on a total of 15 of their stores uh, across Malaysia, which is fantastic news, real leadership. We look forward to companies um, investing more uh, and, and, uh, and following, their, following their example. However, a rooftop is relatively small, even for a Tesco, even on a Tesco store. And these things work better at scale. And we would really encourage um, the policymakers to think about how companies can invest in scale, um, as with the picture on the left hand side, to actually achieve the cost savings that are available through investing at scale rather than simply rooftop. But rooftop schemes are a fantastic start. It's certainly not the end of the game. And finally, in terms of political support, um, Alok Sharma, the COP president, has called for more companies to commit to 100% renewable sources by 2050 at the latest through the RE100 initiative. We're really honoured to have the COP president endorse the campaign in this way. Um, the reason um, Alok uh, endorsed the campaign was because he saw that we mean business and the, the companies within RE100 really mean business. This isn't just a commitment that you make for some time in the future and forget about it. it it's, it's very focused, it's very now, and companies are investing at scale in, in renewable electricity, which is really opening up doors and creating opportunities. And we see this as a win-win-win. So it's, it's a win for the companies who are investing in renewable electricity because they're saving money. It's, win, it's, it's a win for the suppliers because they're getting a guaranteed buyer for their renewable electricity products. And it's a win for governments because this represents corporate investment in renewable electricity that's helping governments achieve their climate goals. You may have noticed I've hardly mentioned the climate during this, um, this talk. Of course, the climate is incredibly important. We are one year into the climate decade. We have nine years left to sort out our carbon emissions. But even if you don't care at all about climate, renewable electricity makes business sense. And really now is the time to get on board because it's not about whether the renewable electricity transition is happening, it's how fast and it's who will be on board and who will be left behind during that rapid transition from fossil fuel to renewable. So thank you very much. Uh, here's a, a link to our website and a, a picture I'm particularly pleased about, which is the New York Stock Exchange with um, RE100 emblazoned in lights on Times Square, which is, um, I never thought would happen with a, with, with a campaign that started with just, just two crazily ambitious companies. So um, thank you very much for your time and attention. I'll be, I'll be here for questions later. I'm handing back to Marina. All right. Thank you, Sam, for your presentation. Um, it is eye-opening to hear about how RE100 is moving the needle on the zero carbon transition and that you've had fairly, in fact, I would say very good success around the world, even here in the Asia Pacific region. Um, and I, I take it that you're saying that the transition is happening. So, you know, move with it or get left behind. Right. Um, our second present Excuse me. Our second presenter is um, Dr. Wayne Chen. Let's hear her perspective on the renewable energy transition. Wayne, would you take it away? Hi. Um, thank you very much, Marina. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, we are. Wonderful. Thank you. So, um, Marina, thank you very much for your very generous introduction. And also, um, thank you to Datin Tsiri um, Sunita for um, inviting me to speak in this platform. And I'm also very pleased to see um, in the chat box and also in the attendees that there are some very dear friends, you know, uh, mine that are attending it. Notably, I want to comment on Dr. Wong Kui Huang. She's waking up at seven o'clock in the morning in Scotland to dial in. And there's my ex-colleague Hasru from SEDA. There's also Neil from SolarVest. But in case if I miss your names out, um, you know, I apologize. I'm now on the full screen mode already. 
So um, very quickly, some background on Hibiscus, which Marina has already introduced. Um, Hibiscus is a company that is listed in the main board of the Bursa Malaysia. Um, we are the first um, private companies that is actually on oil and gas exploration and production that's listed. And um, today we have operating assets in the North Sea in UK as well as in um, North Sabah. Yeah? So um, very quickly, um, introducing on the background of why we are here today, I think it's always the conversation on the climate change which brings us all together. Yeah, and I think for this slide here, just now Sam has already mentioned, we really have less than 10 years to address our 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature increase. And if you look at the graph here, basically from DNVGL is saying that we are not going to make it there, yeah? You know, with the non-efforts that we have at the moment, what we are going to most likely end up is a 2.3 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. And it's a no wonder that um, young generations led by the Greta Thunberg, they have been making a lot of waves recently and so should they because this is the future that we are talking about here. Yeah? So very quickly, uh, some slides from SEDA, which um, I was attached for nine years and I'm still very fond of the agency. And um, just to share with you, because I can see questions coming in already, and I'm sure um, later on we'll take it from there. But a quick introduction on the renewable energy programs in Malaysia. You can see on the chart here, bottom left, um, as at the end of 2018, renewable energy um, only constitutes about 23% of the entire power mix. And that is inclusive of the large hydro, yeah? And um, with regards to the program that is available in Peninsula Malaysia, we have um, started off on the right-hand side of the slide is the fill-in tariff that is implemented by SEDA back in end of 2011, which um, at the start of it, it does cover solar PV, biomass, biogas, and small hydro. But because PV price have dropped down so drastically in the last few years, PV has dropped out of the um, fill-in tariff and it has progressed into three other um, programs. One that is the large scale that's implemented by Energy Commission. And the other two are the rooftop programs, which is the net energy metering and the self-consumption. So the net energy metering um, is implemented by SEDA and the self-consumption is by the Energy Commission. And the difference between the two is that under the net energy metering, um, you can actually sell off the surplus of your solar electricity to TMB on a one-on-one -on -one offset, whereas for the cell call, you're not allowed to actually export any of the um, electricity. So out of that rooftop program, it has spawned up quite a few um, initiatives. You know, you can um, either buy PV outright through cash or credit card, but otherwise, um, since 2019, um, last year, we have seen a rise of a new form of um, procurement for um, solar very common among the, um, the commercial and the industrial, the CNI sector, that you can go for the power purchase agreement or for the leasing format. And, and I believe that um, SolarVest does provide all these, um, all these um, um, services. But of course, in SEDA's website today, we have um, over 150 companies that are actually doing installations and over 100 companies that are doing the investors, which means that you can actually lease their um, solar services. Now, just to share with you that um, while I was still with SEDA, I was helming the Renewable Energy Transition Roadmap, and it was around 90% finished when I um, left SEDA two months ago. And out of that um, scope of the Renewable Energy Transition Study, one of them is on the... Um, um, technical potential of renewable energy. So since this particular webinar focused a lot on solar, so I thought I'll share with you the PV potential for rooftop in each of the states. Yeah? So you can see here that um, in, especially in Selangor, we really have a lot of rooftop space, over 9,000 megawatts. And in the whole of Malaysia, we're talking about 42,000 megawatts of the rooftop space, and that only constitutes 40% of the rooftop space. We assume the other 60% will not be practical, 
maybe for shading reason um, or the way that it is tilted and also maybe the age of the roof and the, the way that it is sized as well. And you can see at the bottom of the map that um, Malaysia is also very well endowed with solar energy. The best of the sun is really in Sabah and also on the northern side of Peninsula Malaysia. Where I come from in Kuching, unfortunately, the solar irradiance is not so um, very strong. So I'm going to talk very um, briefly about the net energy metering because there is an urgency to it. Um, the urgency to it is because the five-year program for this in which 500 megawatt is allocated to it is coming to the end by the end of this year. So we have only effectively six weeks left. And it is a very attractive program. This particular quota at the bottom of the slide is actually just um, taken in an hour before this seminar starts. And you can see that we have still quite a fair bit of quota left, 126 megawatt left. But um, you know, the time is running out and you, it is advisable not to submit your net energy metering application to SEDA just a day before the closing date here. Yeah? Plus, if you are beyond a certain capacity, you will have to do a power system study. So that will take a bit of time. And if you wish to actually size up uh, an estimate of how much it costs, you can also scan on the QR code here and it will lead you to the net energy metering calculator that you can use it as an estimate. But an important thing for a company is that MIDA does offer green investment tax allowance. Uh, it was announced back in budget 2020 and that um, green investment tax allowance is valid until the end of 2023. Yeah. So I'm coming to the end of my slide. So these are some, some of the quick key takeaways. You know, there are growing um, societal pressures, as Sam has mentioned, from government and corporates to embrace the sustainability agenda. And I'm, I really would like to congratulate Sam that you have really tied in the 100, RE100 agenda so very beautifully within the Malaysian context and also within the international context. And also, of course, with the US election just gone by and by Biden's win. And he has already mentioned in his um, earlier campaign that, you know, his government, his administration may be considering imposing the carbon um, tax as well, yeah? So these are some things that we have to consider. It's not just from the EU side, but it also could be from the US side. And also the COVID-19 provides us an opportunity to reset our priorities. Today, if we want to pour money into the economy, we might as well pour it in a way that it is uh, addressing the green agenda because um, the climate change is a far greater pandemic compared to the COVID-19. And I think importantly, we have to remember is that sustainable energy is not a zero sum game. It's not that if I spend on this, then I will lose on the other part of it. Actually, um, a very important point by now, we have learned out of this, if you have looked at the market cap of some of the companies, you know, the renewable companies are doing very well, the tech stocks are doing very well. So we believe that decarbonizing strategies, even for hibiscus, is that in order for us to remain you know, you know, um, relevant, we must be, first of all, sustainable. Yeah? Then we are going to be investable at the end of the day. And of course, I think very critically, what is the lowest hanging fruit is really to put on solar on the rooftop. That will be the easiest way. Now, I'm going to end this by giving a very quick advertisement because next week, I'm going to be moderating a very exciting session on the P2P energy trading. And I think that this will be another way that we can scale up rooftop markets in the future of energy, whereby digital, digi the word is digitalization will be the innovation to actually increase um, rooftop applications. Yeah, on this note, um, Marina, thank you very much. And it's over to you. All right. Thank you, Winnie, for that presentation. Really appreciate hearing about the renewable energy programs that were developed by SEDA, especially the attractive incentives in the NEM and GITA instruments. Um, and also, uh, Yeah. 
Sorry, Marina, we can't hear you at the moment. We seem to, we seem to have a technical uh, problem. So I think what, what we're opening it, how much solar PV potential there is in Malaysia are really interesting. And so we'll have some time to discuss it. Um, Mr. Davis Chong, uh, from a solar developer. Davis, your Hi, thanks, Marina. Uh, and also thank uh, CGM okay. for inviting SolarVest. And also thanks uh, Latin Sri Sunita for inviting us to share a bit more on the solar energy outlook in Malaysia. Let me share my screen. Okay, I, I hope that everyone get my screen right now. So I think a um, uh, 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 very good information from Sam and also uh, um, Dr. Wini on the policy, on how does the global uh, industry look like and uh, what is the drive of the industry globally. So I think uh, SolarVest being part of the market enabler in Malaysia domestically uh, will present things as more to how does this work and what is the what is the stage of the market look like? And uh, of course, uh, we're talking a bit about uh, financial feasibility as well. That how do we make this industry and this initiative, the green initiative that uh, more feasible for, for the particular Malaysian market? Okay, I think the first one where we talk about the energy or, or green or renewable energy, we talk about the LCOE of uh, particular in solar PV projects. So what impact those? LCO is that levelized cost of electricity that, that in the, the EPCC cost, the material cost, and also the capacity factor will play a, a, a contributions to the cost. As you can see, you know, um, SolarWest started in 2012. Uh, I still remember the price of uh, installation costs, you know, even panel is, is very high. The first, the first time that I approached solar PV module price that time, which when we haven't even got uh, FIT in Malaysia, that time is about more than $1. I think it's about $1.05 to $2 per watt. You know, we're talking about how to enable uh, FIT, how to make solar energy more affordable. So that time, you know, we just want to drive the panel price per watt to $1. And you can see with that improvement, cost improvement until now, we have about from 4,007 to 995 uh, uh, per kilowatt of the installation cost. And you can see the LCOE, it dropped from about 40 cents to about six, uh, 60 over cent now. So we do expect that, you know, um, from rooftop itself and also the IPP itself, we will have a lot of, uh, uh, cost improvement down the road uh, towards the 2025. Even the 2020 now, we have already can achieve near to the grid parity that we, we're gonna talk about it. Okay, so particularly follow the global trend of the material cost improvement, EBCC cost improvement, and also the maintenance cost, the financing cost, the land cost as well, that uh, you can see that how it translates to the uh, EPCC cost uh, per project that what we're talking about at megawatt size. Probably in 20122, we're talking about um, uh, about 10,000 10, or 11,000 per kilowatt. Then it's already go down to 3,000 or 2,004 this year per kilowatt. Then it translates to about a megawatt size, about 2.4 million. That's just average uh, for a typical uh, IPP project or utility skill that we are doing ground now. So if you're doing a floating, uh, floating solar mode, then it will be like 10% more than uh, ground mount. And if you're doing a rooftop, it's even more lesser than, than what, we, what we can do now. So, so the price has dropped tremendously that to make uh, we are near, we are moving nearer to grid parity itself. So with this LCOE improvement and the conventional electricity rates that we, we, got, we, we see that the coal energy is going up. So with, the, with one of the reference that we got from single buyer that we see the S&P price is still around 13 to 14 cents, sometimes it get a bit higher. 
with the LCOE that we calculated in Malaysia or even reference to global price, we are around uh, uh, 20, about 20 cents or sometimes if a rooftop, we can go to 14 to 15 cents. So I, I, I would say that we are somewhere around reaching the grid parity that, uh, that uh, we will be reaching it very soon. We, we do expect that the material cost of the solar panel and, and uh, the, the system cost will be, be going down a bit further. I think that, that, that directions uh, of the cost is, is in the right directions. And we also see the conventional electric, electricity rate that it is going up and, and from time to time. Okay, some of the key factors that we want you, uh, we want you all to know and we want to share to you is being an EPCC for about eight years and, um, and starting to involve in the developer, you know, what are the key factors that we need to know before we want to invest, uh, particularly in solar energy? Either it's IPP, utility skills, or in, in rooftop solar as well. So the first one, uh, before, before uh, you start to invest on an, in a new, new country or in any country that we, you need to know exactly how or what is the country policy roadmap. You know, is it a, 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 a short term, is it long term? Uh, is it being drafted towards a, a five to 10 years plan? So we put an example, um, Malaysia is, is not a super aggressive country that in solar energy uh, or, or, or in renewable energy, but we, we, we being regarded as one of the most stable, uh, one, of the, one of the country that with stable policy, when you can see that we have LSS1, LSS2, LSS3, and follow on with LSS4 this year, that steadily it give up 500 megawatt quota per uh, LSS. So we, we also can know that how is how the policy, uh, the, the RFP for the LSS standard is being improved from every LSS to uh, another LSS. So until the LSS fall now, our, our RFP tender by Energy Commission has been respected by, I think the whole region is one of the best RFP, one of the best way to, to tender out the large scale solar farm. And our, our PPA, uh, LS, uh, renewable energy PPA is also one of the most bankable in Southeast Asia region. So combined with NEDA uh, policy now, and of course, uh, net energy metering has been doing very well uh, from uh, the NA 1.0, 2.0, and we are expecting 3.0 right now. So, so I would say that the, the policy, particularly in Malaysia, that is very encouraging across all the different scale of the projects. The second thing is, of course, is the financial capability. So one of the way that uh, um, I think one of the early challenges for Malaysia uh, solar investment is uh, we don't get good support from the bank or financial institutions. Uh, when, um, when we have two, uh, LSS1 and 2016, you know, it's very difficult to find banks that are able to finance the project and, and they know how to do it. Uh, uh, even the insurance company that, that, that is difficult that we can get their services. So, but towards, uh, I mean, few years development in large scale uh, infrastructure projects, uh, Malaysia finance institutions across the bank, I would say that they already have a very good uh, uh, model to finance all the large scale solar farm projects. A lot of banks, they know how to raise bond for any projects that are larger than 150 million or 200 million projects. And also uh, for typical smaller scale project, let's say it's a few megawatt to 10 megawatt, or even few hundred kilowatt, you can easily approach a bank to do the financing. We, we, we can see a lot of banks that uh, we cooperate with them and to link them up to our clients as well. So, so it has been very well developed now. And uh, another thing that also, uh, uh, for especially for large scale solar farm, we need to understand the bankability of the projects uh, when uh, particularly on the utility scale. So what is the financial mar financing margin for the local local financing institutions? And what is the uh, 
project IRR that they are expected to be bankable? What is the equity IRR that uh, is, is expected to be bankable? In Malaysia, for typical bank uh, that, that they will accept to be, bank, to be bankable is about, uh, project will be around uh, 8% and uh, equity will be around 10%. So, but it all will go back to the how strong is a, a, a client or asset owners. Uh, sometimes that uh, you're still able to negotiate that even five six percent of uh, uh, project IRR they will take it as well. So, but but uh, there are already a lot of uh, financial institution in Malaysia that they are capable to do that. So the third, of course, is the demand supply are forecasting that uh, we will need to uh, we will need to follow the policy that what is the expectations of solar energy demand and uh, also is the utility tariff that we got in this country. So we do expect the renewable energy, LCOE or PPA that offer in the market is getting cheaper and cheaper. Then uh, the tariff gonna stay the same or sometimes even go higher in the next few years. Then the demand of solar energy will be getting higher and higher for let's say for corporate PPA. And for utility scale, that will go back to the uh, country policy that uh, what is the uh, megawatt that the government will approve for the next quarter. Uh, this is particularly in Malaysia, but every country in outside East Asia, they have a different model to give, it, to give up the PPA. So uh, we might need to understand the policy, then we know how the, the demand and supply works. Okay, the fourth one is a bit technical that we, we, you, we need to have a partner to know how to do site visibility study. Whether it's a rooftop or whether it's a, a ground mount or even floating, it has the technical part of the feasibility study that you need to have EPCC as a partner or project developer as a partner that to give you a very good technical assessment of the projects so that it will determine what is the cost of the projects and what is the return of the project that it will give you based on the tariff expectations. So it also depends on the scales of the project as well. But the last one, of course, uh, you, you need to have a good partner on EPCC or even the product supplier sites that uh, what is the technology that uh, uh, the, the, the principal uh, manufacturer is moving, example, that uh, we're moving from polysilicon uh, uh, panel to monosilicon now, which majority of the project is using a monosilicon uh, panels uh, and also, you know, we're moving from central inverter to uh, string inverter right now. So there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of new development in the technology uh, that which uh, you will need to get to the suppliers and EPCC to understand. So what is the best technology? What is the most the most cost effective technology for you to build into your project? So that is the five aspect that we think that this is most important to understand before you decide to invest into solar. Okay, other than that, maybe I touched a little bit on the key challenges while this eight years as an EPCC and uh, as, a, as, a developer, as a developer of the, of the project. So we are also, we are also uh, a company that we are developing from zero. We are, we are actually, our background is from m and So uh, in this, we learn from different different projects before to start to do start to focus on the solar engineering design. So, which is very important to have a strong technical team and design team to suit uh, to customize or tailor the design according to the site and according to the challenges of the site. Um, in in different way, whether it's a rooftop uh, or whether it's a ground mount or floating, it also will have the uh, technical challenges that we need to overcome. So one of the things that it is very important to have the most cost effective and the reliable, uh, long lasting design that for a solar energy project, because it's going to last for, let's say 25 years uh, for the warranty. All right. David, Another, yeah. Davis, um, I hope you don't mind. We're sort of running short on time. Okay, I, um, I can go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but could you just show the, the slides that you have on the case studies, uh, which was the two projects? 
Okay, yeah. Sure, very quickly and just, yeah, 10 minutes, 10 seconds. Okay. Okay, the, the things that I want to share with uh, our, our, our attendees, uh, this is one of the projects that we do uh, for phase one for Tesco project. It's about 12.2 megawatt uh, for across 13 sites of okay. Tesco. Right. And next time you visit Tesco, you will see that. It's a PPA model. Uh, right. We are using J solar, oil inverters, and it's a retro retrofit rooftop as well. Yes. And of course, it offset 13,000 13, tons of CO2 annually. Fantastic. And <laughs> this is another one. It's the world largest semiconductor chip maker. It's about 4 megawatt. We can't tell the name because they don't allow us to use that name as marketing. So That's this right. is one of, the, uh, one of the biggest projects that we do in Malaysia. It's a FM Global approved standard, which is very important for industrial or factories. Uh, to, to, to make sure the system is safe to be installed on their rooftop. And this project, we also offset 4,000 tons of CO2 annually. And it's using sun power and sun growth system. Um, all right. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Davis. I'm sorry I had to cut you off. It no was problem, very no interesting problem. stuff. And I, the key takeaway is that, you know, solar pricing is so attractive that, you know, everybody should be doing right now, right? Yep. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, this brings us now to our panel session, and we'd like to bring all those speakers back in, um, in terms of um, being able to get them to put in their opinions to some of the questions that we're going to uh, pose to them. And uh, it's uh, very, oh, it's very helpful that some of the audience have actually asked some questions, and some of the questions have actually been answered in the Q and A section by some of the speakers already. So perhaps um, I won't touch those questions that have been um, asked. Um, I will instead um, ask the questions that have not yet been answered. And the, the, the one of the questions that have not yet been answered is, um, <coughs> are there RE100 companies in Malaysia right now? So Sam, could you answer that? Yes, so there are around, at uh, last count, of, so we're collecting our data at the moment, um, so I can't give you, a, give you a definitive figure, but around 20 of our members have operations in Malaysia, and several more have supply chains in Malaysia, but we have currently no Malaysian headquartered companies in RE100. So, for example, the rooftop array I showed you was, was Tesco, who, which is an RE100 member. They use 1% of the electricity in the UK. Uh, mm -hmm. They also have branches in, in Malaysia where they're uh, moving quickly on their 100% target. Right. So we would look forward to welcoming the first Malaysian company. <laughs> Super. I believe um, one of the audience members, or Davis, would like to also answer this question about... Um, yeah, um, okay, I think I got this question, man. It's many rounds. Uh, people do concerns about the, what's the lifespan of solar panels, though. Yeah. Uh, if if, if you, have been, you have explored about solar panel PV system to uh, all the tier one uh, PV manufacturer, you will know that uh, the typical uh, warranty for the solar panels is 25 years. So it's a very long uh, period of time that they, they put warranty. So most important that you're going to select a, a, a financially strong uh, PV manufacturer to make sure that they are still around for up to 25 years. So, so it's not so much about the technology. But the lifespan of the PV panel itself, typically, you know, as part of the people in the industry, I do expect that, you know, even for 30, 40 years that it can, it can still give you generate energy, you know. Uh, so just part of the, uh, maybe the junction box will be the one that who has problem, but not the PV panels that is not gen generating energy but we do not have uh, actual data to show you because solar PV project in Malaysia, the, the, the oldest is probably you know, 10 years than, than from now. So uh, with, the, with the manufacturer's uh, data sheets and warranty, mm -hmm. we do believe that that will last more than 25 years. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, most of them doesn't need a recycle program because it's a standard waste, it's an aluminum, uh, it's a tempered glass, it's a semiconductor material, it's a silicon material. So it can be uh, just recycled as a normal waste. Yeah, it's only those companies that have installed the oh, yeah. telluride panels yep, that they yep. have to be careful. Some of the hydrogen material yeah. panels. Yeah, but there is I also mean, consideration about the lead in the solar panel um, 
materials as well. But yes, those will be addressed in, in time to come um, as, yeah. Yeah, as solar panels get retired. Yeah, there'll mm -hmm. be more issues about how to recycle them. Thank you for that answer, Davis. There's one more question, Anna, and and uh, it is concerning the CNI. Ah, um, I can answer that. I can answer that. <laughs> yes, Davis, would you like to answer that? The question actually is, what are the main drivers for the CNI sectors in Malaysia uh, in mm -hmm. installing photovoltaics? Is it government policy or business consideration? I think it's both. I think it's both. It's, uh, the first thing is the government policy is very encouraging. It, LSS program built up the volume, the mass volume for uh, uh, megawatt projects from Malaysia. And then the NEM program built up a very good policy, you know, one-to-one uh, -one offset, and uh, all the all the capacity that being given is very encouraging for anyone to do it in the capex or PPA model. And for business considerations, uh, let's not talk about investing any money into the solar. What you're paying uh, with the utility utility rate in Malaysia right now. Let's say I offer you a PPA that at any time I can give you a twenty percent discount of your utility bill. Why don't you do it? Uh, of course, this is this is a win-win that I'm able to become a PPA owner and I maybe become a micro IPP and mm -hmm. you're able to save 20% of your utility bill. Uh, I, I think this is a good trade-off. Right. Davis, um, I'd like to extend that line of thinking a little bit further. Um, Malaysia right now sets an annual cap on the amount of renewable energy that is allowed, right? Yeah. Um, but recent applications have, sh have shown that uh, interest is surging and it's gone way beyond the, <laughs> you know, uh, allowable cap. Yeah. Um, so what are your thoughts on this? Should there, um, should there be a larger cap or no cap at all? Um, you know, how would that affect future? Um, are you as part of the stakeholder in the, in the industry, of course, I hope no cap for the capacity from the government. But the cap from the the cap from the uh, policy that um, it always uh, make us to become a country that we are we are slow and steady. You know, uh, we have five hundred megawatts of uh, NEM to be uh, to be consumed in the five years, and uh, based on the data today, we have about uh, one hundred to thirty over megawatt left. So, but you can see the development of the NEM quota, particularly in rooftop, that. Last year is about 24 megawatt for industrial. It becomes 200 megawatt capacity okay. being applied for this year. For commercial, it's about 10 megawatt. Then it's about 80 to 90 megawatt uh, applied in this year. So we see a lot of positive development in the, in the commercial industrial segment to participate in the rooftop solar. So it's the residential so, segment that's lagging, is it? Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, most of them, you know, we discussed with Dr. Wayne, we're afraid that this 500 megawatt not able to consume, but with recent development, mm -hmm. you know, we give assurance that this 500 megawatt will be, will be consumed, finished by the year end. Mm -hmm. And we hopefully by this sign of the market acceptance, you know, the government will double the 500 megawatt or triple it, you know, to give wow. more okay. capacity uh, to create a bigger momentum in the next five years. I hope this message gets yeah. to the policymakers, Davis. You're asking for a doubling or tripling of the cap. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. yes. Right, I we'll think in our last proposal yeah. from MPIA, we're mm -hmm. asking for 3,000 megawatt. But I, I, <laughs> that, that's really a lot. Excellent. A, a Sam, scale, of, to, yes. a scale of ambition is incredibly important. And uh, yes. it, the, the BNEF have, uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance have undertaken, have found that there's a yeah, the, the costs drop as, as installations grow, um, but also they found that once an industry gets beyond the, uh, the four gigawatt installation mark, the, pr mm -hmm. the prices suddenly drop very quickly because it shows that the, what happens there is the industry reaches a scale where they can install more efficiently, they can uh, take advantage of local production, etc. And this has happened in Taiwan, this has happened in Europe, this has happened in the US. You get this sudden drop off around four gigawatts of installed capacity. Um, mm -hmm. And it's thought that there will probably be a second one as capacity grows, as installed capacity grows even more. So it's really important. Yeah, you know, th these things tend to grow exponentially because the more you install, the cheaper it gets. So yeah. caps, you know, slowly, slowly will not be the way forward for, for most governments in, in future. We really need to accelerate this from a climate point of view and from a market point of view. 
yeah. agree with you. Sam, thank you for that input. So let me ask you now, Sam, what would you say to, to the government right now, um, you know, in terms of RE100 coming in to Malaysia and saying, look, we'd like um, Malaysian companies headquartered in Malaysia, uh, Malaysia-owned multinationals to join the RE100. And, you know, we think some policies need to be in place to encourage these um, Malaysian-based uh, multinationals. What would you say to the government now? So I can't speak on behalf of the members because, you know, e e they're with 267 members, each has their slightly different thing that they want, depending on the, uh, you know, whether a data centre company or a clothing company, etc. So I, I wouldn't want to put words in their mouths. Um, mm. I think the... So I won't recommend a, a specific policy, but I would say... You know, within the cons within the the obvious constraints of a uh, uh, of of a country with incredible natural resources and incredible um, uh, forestry, etc., um, think about scale. Think about allowing scale, enabling companies to buy uh, to engage in power purchase agreements at scale. Mm -hmm. um, and going beyond rooftop or enabling, uh, you know, continuing to enable rooftop, but yeah, allowing, allowing more and more and more scale, uh, more interconnection, et cetera. It, it's let companies in to invest is, yeah. is really important. It's not just important for the companies themselves, it's, it's important for Malaysia as a supply chain and a really important supply chain engine for the world. Um, particularly clothing companies are getting together now to go right we want all our suppliers to be renewable and that that's yeah. a trend that we are seeing amongst our membership so enabling enabling purchase at scale is going to be very important yes totally agree and i think re100 does play a very big role in that um if the member companies uh which have operations here in malaysia are demanding for more renewable energy um that will provide the scale that's needed isn't it the demand anyway Absolutely. The demand is there. The demand is there. It's, it, and the demand will grow mm. as the market opens up. And I think that's a good message for the policymakers as well. Um, mm. And I think that's a message that the corporates should take here seriously. Uh, Malaysian-based corporates, um, even though they're not members of RE100, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And the, the demand continues to grow. It is, it, is, it is outstripping supply in that what we're finding is companies are investing now where it's easy. So the investment is going into Europe, particularly uh, the Netherlands, Northern Europe, um, the UK. Um, it's going into certain states in the US. Um, the investment isn't going to countries like, um, for example, Korea, um, where it's very difficult to buy renewables. But as soon as it becomes easy, those companies will go, yes, we want to we wanna invest now. So if there's that pent up demand. Companies are just looking elsewhere at the moment. If, if all you can do is a rooftop array, in, in Malaysia, then companies will go, okay, I'll, I'll invest a bit, but I'll put my big spend into China or Vietnam, or etc. Yes, where it's, more, where it's more attractive because you have the larger scale solars. Um, That's it. Yeah, there. Okay. Just one final word maybe from you, Sam. If, if you could help us understand the EU carbon tax by 2022, how much of an impact do you think that would have on, for example, Malaysian corporates, um, you know, in, in the next two to three years after that, up to 2025, for example? Yeah, now, the, the exact scale of impact will depend on, on how high the tax is. Mm. But it will, have, it will certainly have an impact on those companies that haven't cleaned up their act. Right. And that they, they will be able to compare uh, companies operating, you know, dirty coal boilers and, and just using electricity from the grid mm. will be stamped with a tariff. And mm -hmm. so that will mean that not only the end consumer will be less um, willing to buy their product, but also the more importantly, companies like H&M, um, IKEA, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, will be looking elsewhere to buy, buy. Well, they'll be looking for lower carbon suppliers because it'll be cheaper to buy their products. Right. The scale of that, I couldn't tell you. We, yeah. we don't know yet what the, the level of that tax will be, but the, the commission is very serious about this. Uh, so that, you know, is this a, that is a great concern then, and, and Malaysian corporates should take note of that, particularly yeah. because, yeah, particularly because in Malaysia, most of the fossil, most of the electricity is fossil fuel based, right? Yeah. More than 70% of our generation capacity is fossil fuel based, oil, gas. 
uh, and gas. So we note that. Wayne, I'd like to ask you a question, <laughs> uh, if you don't mind this point. Um, Malaysia, and, and this is in, in relation to your little um, advert at the end of your presentation about the P2P. Um, so Malaysia ran a pilot on the P2P trading earlier this year, right? Um, so what was the outcome of that? And, and what do you think is the way forward then for P2P trading for renewable energy in Malaysia? And how will that help corporates here in Malaysia? So I think, uh, Marina, if I say this out, then it will not make the P2P um, session next week very exciting anymore. <laughs> just a little teaser, just a little yeah, because teaser. Because you are, you are stealing a thunder from it. Yeah. But anyway. Just a little teaser. <laughs> So, um, yeah, Seda did run a pilot run for the P2P and, and SolarVest definitely did participate in it as well through their clients, yeah? Mm -hmm. And we had that project um, that ran on a pilot run for a period of um, six months altogether. And initially, we wanted to have the project split into two parts. One is the alpha run, which means that we only test on the technical interoperability mm -hmm. between how the P2P integrates with the entire metering, smart meter infrastructure. Then part two of it comes the commercial part of it. But unfortunately, um, once we have gone through, you know, we had all the technical part of it sussed out, then the COVID came along. Mm. And because the COVID came along, there were a lot of excess electricity that was spilled to the grid and under the sandbox, TMB um, has this rule that they will not fall back on the net energy metering. So they will actually get your electricity for free. So mm -hmm. what it meant is that if um, any participants as prosumers participate in it, they will make a loss because the consumers who are buying from it, they have very little business activity during the MCO period. So as a result, we decided not to have the commercial part of it. We just ran through the entire period on the technical part of it. So the technical part of it, we have proven that there is no issue. I mean, there, there were some, um, some challenges, but nothing that is we couldn't solve. We will resolve everything from the metering to the aggregating of the data to the platform to the mm -hmm. building part of it. But I think the important conversation is that we have finished with the sandbox and we have tabled to the ministry that um, we think it should continue with part two of a sandbox that actually tested the commercial business model Mm -hmm. which um, the, the end users are willing to come in. yeah. Right. So I think uh, that's why we have the conversation next week together with TMB, Power Ledger, Electrify, and interestingly, Petronas is in the game as well. So I think we should all be in there to see what Petronas has to say about the P2P participation. Right. Well, that was a good teaser for next week's um, webinar. Um, but the takeaway really is that the platform has been established um, and it has and uh, run rather successfully despite the COVID, right? Uh, it worked. Mm -hmm. um, it's just because of the COVID situation, um, the, you know, the trading didn't, didn't proceed as, as desired, but basically the platform is there. Yeah, um, you know, Marina, can I, do you mind if I just post two questions? Because there's some questions that I'm dying to ask Sam and also David. <laughs> Go ahead. And I think because I'm just worrying that we are running out of time. So for Sam, the question is that RE100 companies how willing are they to pay a premium price for um, renewable electricity? And for Davis, is that what are the kind of returns that our local um, investors can find if they do um, PV on the rooftops, uh, on the commercial? So it is really commercial questions, if you don't mind, Marina. Because yeah, I get this a lot. I think that's quite relevant. Yeah, that's, that's quite relevant question. Thank you, Sam. Uh, would you like to take that question? And then the Are companies prepared to pay a premium? Um, well, generally, the the I think in the back in 2014, 15, 16, companies were joining RE100 because purely because it was the right thing to do, and they were investing. They were spending more money on on renewables. They wanted to develop their their processes, develop their teams, and so companies like um, well, I won't tell it's any names. Some of the big uh, IT companies. We're actually spending a premium because they, they, they wanted to get experience in doing this. Now that situation has changed and you can get renewables at a competitive price. As David has said, uh, has said you can save 20% um, by, uh, by 
uh, installing your own your own renewables. Um, and so companies are looking for those good deals. And as I said earlier, you know, uh, the investment is going into those places where you can get good deals. We are seeing some exceptions. So companies that have got, you know, they, they've achieved 95, 96, 97 percent, and they've just got a very small percentage of their operation to complete. They will push further and spend a bit more just to get the, you know, complete that 100 percent. But again, that's that's decreasing. Companies are saying, well, hang on, rather than spend extra on the electricity, we'd rather spend that money on policy influencing and um, and make sure that the markets are fair and um, and we, we can get the renewables at a, at a fair and reasonable price. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's part of the strategy, isn't it? And I think some companies have um, utilized the REC um, market as a strategy to get to 100% RE and, and it's, it's viable for the short term, right? Davis, would you like to take the other question? Yeah, um, I think I will answer it in a different angle. Because uh, when we're talking about rooftop uh, uh, projects, there are a few uh, people that benefit from this uh, project model. Okay, the first thing, if you run it in a capex model, the return rate will be a, a, a double-digit IRR, uh, even uh, without the ITA or even IT. So uh, currently, if you do solar project in Malaysia as a capex owner that you can actually claim a GITA, that, that policy lasts until 2023. So this is part of the most uh, why all the company is doing a solar project and investing by themselves. Uh, with the cost of uh, EPCC cost and, and panel is going down so, so much now, and even cut short that uh, the company, if they invest in solar projects on rooftop, uh, with taking the IT as well, then they could probably break even with, within two to three years' time. So that is David, very encouraging. Yeah. Yeah. Davis, that's really um, very important information for corporates because yeah, if the yeah, question yeah. always, you know, is how how soon can I get my returns on this? So yeah, yeah. So about, that's one of the typical questions that uh, yeah. when before the leasing model come. So another yeah. model that we talk about is an OPEX model. It's a leasing mm -hmm. model that mm -hmm. which is really uh, getting into the pace now uh, since last year. Uh, a lot of projects that are being enabled in the market is a leasing model. So when we're talking about OPEX or leasing model, there'll be two people that benefit from here. One is the investor, one is the uh, leaser. So the leaser typically will get around, you know, with the Malaysian market now around 15-20% of discount from your electric electricity rate. Right. So that, that's where you can expect, you know, every unit energy you buy from solar versus DME, then mm -hmm. you get minimum 20%. 15 to 20% okay. discount. Okay. So another thing as an investor that uh, selling the PPA, that investing into the uh, solar PV system and selling as a PPA, then you could actually expect a double digit project IRR as well. Mm -hmm. And you can apply the GITE if your accumulated capacity is above three megawatt as well. So right. this GITE, same as GITA, is also until mm -hmm. 2023. Fantastic. That's yeah. really useful information, Davis. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, we're coming almost to the end of the webinar um, and we would like to um, come back to the, the panelists and um, request uh, one minute last words from all the panelists. Um, Sam, could you kick that off? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, just a, it's a very, very exciting time. And um, it's, it's so exciting to see companies around the world, suppliers around the world and institutions around the world talking really positively about renewable electricity as the future. We're about to see a scaling up of change and whether or not it happens, the, some of the ambition is incredible. If you know about the Sun Cable project in Australia where they're looking to uh, cable electricity uh, across the Straits of Malacca. Um, <laughs> It sounds quite uh, ambitious, but yeah, the ambition is growing and we're, we're about to see some very, very exciting things coming up. And we, we really hope Malaysia will be, be not just part of that, but will be able to take a leadership position. A significant player at least, yeah? Thank you, Sam. Um, Wayne, would you like to add your last one minute? Yeah, thank you very much, Marina. And I'm almost very delighted to have you know, all these partners on board, Sam and also Davis, and also, of course, Marina. They're doing a great job. And I think for my last word here, I really jive with the theme here. The theme here for today is to press ahead with renewable energy. 
And I think um, business, you know, we, we do have a, a moral responsibility for our future generation. And we also do it because it makes business sense at the end of the day, yeah? I think if you just look at Solaves, um stock shares, you know, we should be very excited about that already. And, and we go into renewables because it helps us, it keeps us relevant and it, it keeps us investable at the end of the day. And that's what that helps our business to be sustainable. So thank you very much, Marina. Thank you, Wayne. Super. Davis, your final last minute one words. I think uh, I'll say that uh, whether investing in solar energy project or not, uh, now it's already become a no-brainer question. So I hope that everyone will take it seriously and, you know, it's not whether to invest, it will invest or not. It's just when you want to invest that, you know, yeah. that when you have the capacity. So it's a no-brainer question that it's supposed to be the right direction. Right. Thank you, Davis. Thank you, speakers, Sam, Wayne, and Davis for your fantastic sharing of information. Um, so there we have it, ladies and gentlemen, very thoughtful opinions from leaders in the renewable energy arena today, giving you every reason to make the zero carbon transition. Um, they're telling you that the technology sophistication and the price dives are working in tandem entirely in your favor. So we hope your organization will join the race to zero carbon. We wish you the best and look forward to the outcome. And we thank you very much for your participation in today's webinar. Let's make that transition work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marina. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, panelists. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. Are we having a group photo? <laughs> oh yeah, I can we take one. Okay. All right, ready? Three, two, one. Oh, for oh, us. Yes. <laughs> this in time, you're in the picture. All okay. right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.